Hi, my name is Rich Baker, and uh, for the next few weeks, months, who knows, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. I've long wanted to uh, look into Daniel, but was pretty intimidated by uh, all the prophecy at the end and so forth. But after doing some reading, uh, it seems much more clear now, and I do want to share with you what um, what I found out. I hope it uh, hope it's useful to you. What you see before you is a timeline of the uh, chronological uh, writings of the book of Daniel. And notice I said chronological because this is not the order that uh, we see the book of Daniel laid out. Uh, notice that uh, chapters 5 and 6 and 10 in particular are way out of line. But there's a really good reason for that, and I'm pretty excited to, to show that to you. So stick around, and we'll discover it together. Now, the book of Daniel is considered the apocalypse of the Old Testament. And it actually has a prediction of the birth of Christ to the day. Now, I mentioned that the order of the books that we're accustomed to in the book of Daniel are not in chronological order. But here's a list of the books, and as you saw in the timeline, here's a list of the books that are in chronological order, and these dates are taken from uh, the kings. So we know certain kings were in certain dates, and if he stated that in the third year of Darius or whatever, well, that pretty much nails down pretty close to uh, when that book was written. I notice also in the table of all the chapters of the book of Daniel, uh, there is some detail brought out besides uh, the title and the year. Daniel was written in two different languages originally. It was written in Hebrew and in Aramaic. Now it's said that uh, Hebrew is, of course, the language of the Hebrews. Uh, but Aramaic is uh, a language more related to Gentiles. It's been said that as a chapter is written in Aramaic, maybe the Gentiles should pay more attention. And if it's written in Hebrew, maybe the Hebrews should pay more attention. I've also colored this particular table to lay out generally what the chapter is all about. Is it historical? Did it tell a story from Daniel's past? Or is it prophetic? Is it looking way into the future, or at least the future as in what was future to them at that point? Uh, we'll also see that the future also uh, includes time that has not happened in our day yet, so our future. So the table on the far left is what you just saw. So it's all the chapters laid out in chronological order, which if you and I were writing a book, we'd probably write it in chronological order. But the middle table shows the order that we see in the Bible. Well, why? Why did they do that? But if you look at the uh, purpose of the chapter, which is uh, historical or prophetic, and the language that it was written in, look how it lines up. Well, that can't be the only reason that... Um, that these chapters were lined up in a way that they were lined up. We have to start looking at um, what they call chiastic structure. Now, I probably should have learned this in high school English, but I did not. A chiastic structure is one that shows a very interesting pattern. A chiasm is a literary device in which a sequence of ideas is presented and then repeated in reverse order. The result is a mirror effect as the ideas are reflected back in a passage. The structure of a chiasm is usually expressed through a series of letters, each letter representing a new idea. For example, the structure A, B, B, A refers to two ideas, A and B, repeated in reverse order B and A. Often the chiasm includes another idea in the middle of the repetition, so it would be A, B, X, new idea, B, A. In this structure, the two ideas, A and B, are repeated in reverse order, but a third idea is inserted before the repetition. 
By virtue of its position, the insertion is emphasized. So to put it very simply, if we're looking at an ABBA example, we could say something like, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. There are two chiasms in the book of Daniel, one in Aramaic and one in Hebrew. Both sets of chiasms appear to be parallel in content and in meaning, which may be why the book is not in chronological order. Chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic, appear to be one chiasm. Then, of course, chapters 8 through 11 appear to be the second chiasm. Both chiasms appear to be precise parallels in content and meaning. Notice the tan A's. In chapter 2, it talks about the four world empires. Down to chapter 7, it talks about four world empires. The B of the tan, in chapter 3, talks about the Hebrew children that the, went into the fiery furnace. In chapter 6, talks about Daniel in the lion's den. So two major tests. And then the C portion of the chiasm. In chapter 4, the humiliation of Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, the overthrow of, and the death of Belshazzar, which... Both of those are Gentiles. So the second major chiasm, remember this is the second one is in Hebrew, in chapters 8 and 11, it talks about the uh, Persian and the Greece empires. The B portion talks about intercessory prayer. On chapters 9 and 10, and then the middle section there talks about in uh, 925 and 927 is the C section. So this is a pretty deep chiasm. The decree to build, rebuild Jerusalem and the decree that Jerusalem uh, would be destroyed and the temple desecrated. And then here's that third or the fourth rather uh, level of the chiasm. Uh, the Messiah would be cut off in 926. And the whole thing is wrapped from chapters 1 to chapter 11 and talking about the Babylonian siege and the temple destruction. And then in chapter 11, the Roman siege and temple destruction. So the way this is arranged is a near perfect chiasm uh, based on their topics driven by the language and by default, I suppose, their uh, historical or prophetic purpose. Daniel is one of at least four teens taken to Babylon. How far away is it? It's 800 miles away-ish. Long trip. Now the northern kingdom, of course Israel was cut up into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was taken captive by the Assyrians around 732 B.C. The Syrians were a very, uh, let's say, vile people. Uh, when they took captives, they would take over another nation. They would rape the women, take the kids, and fillet the men. However, when they did take men back to Assyria without killing them, they would put a hook through their nose and string them like fish. Now, the southern kingdom was taken captive by the Babylonians around 607 B.C., The Babylonians had a totally different strategy. The captives were shown the beauty of the city. They were welcomed, and they, well, they wanted the people that were brought in to raise families and become a part of them. It was arranged around 200 square miles along the Euphrates River. They had a 60-mile wall around the city that was 300 feet high and 80 feet thick. The Euphrates River was diverted around the city as a natural moat and then under the walls of the city in order to bring resource into the city. There was a 400-foot hanging garden in the city of Babylon, even though there has been no verified proof of that hanging garden. So the Babylonian method of 
captive indoctrination was very different, obviously, than the Assyrians. Number one, they would physically isolate their captives from their home support. Look at verse 3. They would mentally indoctrinate them, verses 3 and 4. They would alter their identities. They even change their names, we're going to see in verse 7. For those that were placed in service in the palace, it meant castration as eunuchs. This was prophesied in Isaiah 39, 7. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. What was the purpose? To ensure none of the servants would sleep with the queen and taint the royal line. Thus Babylon has been a metaphor of a society that draws and entices people away from the Lord. Daniel would live and die in Babylon, but never let Babylon live in him. Just like in the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis, Daniel knew this whole event was part of God's plan, and he continued to have faith. Now, the real city of Babylon was overrun by the Medes and the Persians and has never been rebuilt. And according to Isaiah, it never will. Check this out. Isaiah 13, 17 to 20. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will have no pity on children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. So God was not impressed with Babylon, but he used Babylon, clearly, from what we've seen, to take, take Judah away and to, in a sense, punish them for what we will see will be right at about 70 years. Well, I trust that you have received something from this high-level intro to the book of Daniel. Stay tuned for the rest of the installments, chapter by chapter. Thanks for watching.